Welcome to Xinjiang. It's a province in western China and home of the Uyghurs, a mostly Muslim cultural group. Nujimal Atawala is a Uyghur, and like other Chinese individuals, according to Wired, she loved WeChat, which is a social media platform where you can share messages. She remembered the days when she sent emojis and chats with her children. But one day she heard rumors that actually the Chinese government was monitoring her messages, and at first she didn't believe them. Then the cameras came. The New York Times reported that in a single block, they spotted over 25 cameras watching them as they walked down the street. And these cameras were smart, merged with art advanced artificial intelligence such as facial recognition systems, and constantly scouring the streets. They were able to identify people with frightening precision and accuracy. One day, Nujamal noticed that the police checks became more frequent. She remembered nights when her children would cower in fear as the police knocked on their door in the middle of the night asking to search their apartment. Soon enough, the harassment became so intense that she and her husband decided to leave. Unfortunately, her children's passports were taking longer to arrive, and her husband urged her to go first to Turkey. She reluctantly agreed, but as soon as she stepped out of China, her husband and her children were detained. All her WeChat friends slowly started blocking her, and she remarked that this was one of the loneliest days of her life, that she could not get back in touch with her old life. As we adopt new technologies, especially those that are as advanced and effective as artificial intelligence, facial recognition systems, and others that merge with our daily lives, we have to think about the tension between the effectiveness of those systems and empowerment. Who might be disempowered, especially the most vulnerable as we adopt these systems, and how do we make sure that they have a voice in this process? While the situation with Nur Jamal is an extreme case, it still nonetheless tells us about a possible future we may want to avoid as we adopt these fourth industrial revolution technologies in our own society. Plus One, for instance, notes that there's very low trust between the ethnic minority Uyghur group and the Han Chinese. Ultimately, I share this story because it reminds us what's at stake as we adopt these technologies, and it's really hard for us to see sometimes the long-range consequences of them. Yet these questions are actually here now. And I want to share a story about one such example. Welcome to Alphabet City of the Future. It was considered to be built from the internet up. Interestingly, it had all the success factors going for it. To increase efficiency and cut costs, it used smart building raincoats, heated pavements with sensors, object classifying cameras, and autonomous vehicles. Technologies like these, again, merged the digital and algorithmic world with the physical world, which is often called the fourth industrial revolution. And it's heralded by the fact that we're going to have as much as a 300% increase in internet connected devices that will be merging with our streets and public spaces. Furthermore, Alphabet is seen as one of Canada's most influential and trusted brands. It built a solid private public partnership with Waterfront Toronto, and it even engaged the community to source their opinion about what could be changed in the project. Yet it struggled. One of its top privacy advisors, Anne Kavukian, who was formerly Ontario's privacy commissioner resigned, worried about how these technologies could be used for surveillance. Ontario actually fired three major leaders of the project worried about conflicts of interest and other ethical concerns. Canada's version of the ACLU actually filed a national lawsuit to protest the project. And the Canadian press revealed specific interviews with the government who was hesitant to sign off on this landmark Toronto plan. So we have to ask ourselves, what happened? Sidewalk Toronto had all the success factors going for it. Talented engineers, great relationships, yet it's been struggling in its ability to go to market in Toronto. What I argue is that there was insufficient work around thinking about the key predictors of trust. This is what the OECD has unearthed through its cross-national research called the Trust Lab. In its study, it conglomerates around three key predictors of trust. First is that there's incompetent service delivery which harms trust. Incompetent service delivery refers to less safe, less secure, or private service delivery. The second predictor is perception of powerlessness and corruption, which is this feeling that everyday people don't feel like they have a voice in what is being solved and addressed. And third predictor is that there are not fair economic opportunities, and that everyone feels like they have a fair shake at the economic game. What's interesting about the OECD study is that many of these same themes were reflected in the protests around Sidewalk Toronto 
that this is a larger picture of distrust around big technology companies, governments, and other large institutions deciding the future of how we live. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to just focus on one predictor, predictor three, unfair economic opportunities. A variety of experts talk about how there's unequal access to basic needs, anti-competitive policies and favoritism that really addresses and pushes towards this predictor. If we go back to sidewalk, many actually felt that this sort of favoritism of monopoly was at play. One representative, for instance, said that it was unfair for sidewalk to use public land for private gain. Furthermore, the ex-CEO of Blackbird pointed out how the data that would be collected in the sidewalk project and the technologies being iterated on would create strong monopoly market power that will last for many, many years. More generally, these algorithms will ultimately potentially affect access to basic needs. They have the potential to massively scale major inequality. ProPublica, for instance, found that the use of these algorithms in the criminal justice system actually mislabeled African Americans who otherwise had similar levels of crime as twice as likely to commit future crimes, thus giving them harsher criminal penalties. And what happens to the taxi drivers, store clerks, truck drivers, whose jobs are completed, completely automated away? The fourth industrial revolution thus poses many significant challenges in being able to affect access to basic needs. As a result, Klaus Schwab, the chairman of the World Economic Forum, the coiner of the term fourth industrial revolution, points out how inequality is the greatest societal threat to the success of this revolution. And we should take heed. Sidewalks case also shows us that it's in a business imperative that we should pay attention to trust. From these predictors in the cases above, I now come up with what a trust first strategy might look like. Instead of unsafe capacity, we might move toward ethical data strategy. Instead of exclusive processes, we might think about an inclusive process. Instead of unfair policies, where just a few have a fair shake at the economic game, we may think of data-driven priorities to help more meet basic needs and opportunities. So for this presentation, I'll be focused on the second predictor, which is inclusive process. To address this question around how we can empower more, we can look at Porto Alegre, which is the fifth largest city in Brazil. This is a really interesting case study because of this man, Olivia Dutra. He ran for mayor in Porto Alegre, and he was really famous because he was known to be a values-driven leader. In his many decades of public service, he actually never took a public pension once he retired and retired to his modest apartment back in the city. But what he was really concerned about was corruption. He felt that certain actors in society at that time, such as big corporations or well-connected politicians or families, had undue influence over the process. He ran under this message of anti-corruption and democratic reform. And interestingly, his campaign resonated. He was elected by a landslide, and immediately what he focused on was a crucial democratic innovation called participatory budgeting. It sought to solve three different problems. The first was this problem that there was overrepresentation by certain groups at traditional planning meetings. He felt that those that had more resources, more time, more education, had a bigger say in what was being decided. To address this concern, he made concerted efforts to go to communities of vulnerable populations and to engage them, provide them services so that they could have a voice in the planning process. The second problem that he sought to address was the lack of transparency. At that time, many residents and even many officials were not being completely clear about what was going on in the city. Many residents did not understand the reasoning, much less what was being spent using the public budget. To deal with that issue, the core principle of participatory budgeting was to allow more people to decide how money will be spent on the city's budget. And he initiated a few things. The first was to train his officials to learn how to work with community members so that they could be informed about what was happening. And second, even give opportunities to community members to advise and keep tabs on specific funding projects on what the city budget should be spent on. The third problem that he sought to address was the lack of opportunity, the lack of resources for especially vulnerable communities to participate in the process. While he didn't create a perfect solution to this, he initiated a few things that could be helpful. First, this was a regular 
budgeting process that existed. So there was plenty of notice and opportunity for people to understand and organize themselves in ways to get involved. The second was the opportunity for public deliberation. People would come to this meeting, find new perspectives, collaborate with new people, and understand different points of view to challenge and advocate for what they thought the city's budget should be spent on. So what happened with participatory budgeting? Importantly, lives improved. The World Bank pointed out that at least 20% drop in infant mortality rates and a 25% increase in spending on basic needs such as affordable housing and other sanitary requirements. The lesson here is not that we should adopt participatory budgeting thinking it's a silver bullet, although that might be interesting in certain forms, the lesson is that Olivia Dutra was able to do the hard work of partnering with communities, working with them, and figuring out how more can govern their own communities, their own cities themselves. In the future, one of the main limitations that we should think about with participatory budgeting is that it's extremely time consuming. Most people don't necessarily have the time to go to these day long meetings where they're talking with dozens of people. Most people have really busy jobs and lives. And so we might look at one example in Paris that could serve as a way to digitize some of these planning processes. One example is called Madame Mayor, I Have an Idea. And what this opportunity presents is for Parisian residents to upvote what they think are the biggest problems and solutions in their community, sourced by the crowd of their entire city. The city decided to spend millions of dollars to budget out for the best ideas so that people and more people especially from diverse backgrounds, could be part of creating solutions in their own communities. What's really important to recognize is that these platforms will ultimately share sensitive data. And there's a huge problem with this, is that many of these platforms may not have the capacity or the data engineering skills to understand how to share this data safely while protecting people's privacy and security. One solution to consider for these platforms and other data sharing platforms like participatory budgeting is something called no code technical design. And this is part of a larger software development ethos where software developers will create some sort of modular packet of code that people who are non-technical can edit themselves. Here's an example of how this might apply to the data policy and privacy space. In this example, we see no code design apply for using simple English language dropdowns to mask data by default, especially data being tagged as highly sensitive. So for data that was once de-identified like this and perhaps potentially sensitive, being exposed in these data sharing platforms, it could then be turned into this without having to write a single line of code. And again, this empowers more to be able to share data safely and create better insights out of new platforms such as participatory budgeting like Madame Mayor, I have an idea. While Sidewalk Toronto decided to stop pursuing its Quayside project, it nonetheless made giant leaps forward in their digital trust strategy after its initial trust crisis. For instance, it launched a transparency program called the Digital Transparency in the Public Realm so more people could understand what data was potentially going to be collected by them as they walked around the city using a particip participatory process called a charrette to gather those ideas. They also created a design feedback tool called Colab. By using this tool, more people, not just in the physical space, but also in the digital space, could comment on their upcoming master plans and new designs. And finally, they were considering more opportunities to share data safely, responding to the concern that sidewalks data would be controlled by the hands of a few. They had once considered new tools like data trusts to hold that data so that more could use it safely and be empowered by it. Ultimately, we have a choice. We have a choice of creating these highly effective and convenient societies or potentially civic first investments where we think about ethical, inclusive, and data-driven priorities. It's our opportunity to move fast and protect trust. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share these stories with you. I'd love to share some next steps. If you're interested in this conversation, please feel free to check out the link in the slide, tiny.cc slash DW request. I share lots of opportunities for you to get further engaged thinking about technology, equity, and cities, including a data sharing workshop that I'm incubating with NYU's GovLab about how to form data strategies for more inclusive cities. Thank you again for your time.